Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ms. Wilmot, you may continue with redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Violet. Good morning, Ms. Wilmot. Uh, yesterday, we left off talking about uh, sexual, sexual humiliation. Do you remember that? Yes. And I'm showing you exhibit number 558. Oh, I'll make judge. Thank you. Okay. And the prosecutor was asking you questions about trying to fit Mr. Alexander as a victim with sexual, sexual humiliation and degradation, right? Correct. And he, do you remember him talking to you about one single comment that was located in a long tirade instant message from May 26th of 2008 uh, where he refers to himself as a dildo with a heartbeat, right? Yes, I do. And this was, uh, that tirade was May 26th, right? Correct. But it would have been just 16 days earlier that he participated in phone sex with Miss Arias, right? Correct. And you listened to that? Yes, I did. And on that tape, on that particular recording, didn't, didn't he talk about uh, the plan of coming up to visit Miss Arias in Wairika? Yes, he did. And talking about acting on sexual fantasies that he had with her? Yes, he did. And do you remember reviewing a 10-page text message from May 2nd, 2008 from Mr. Alexander to Miss Arias. I do. Uh, and this is Exhibit 391. And in this particular text message, it goes on for 10 pages, but isn't it talking about his fantasy that he has about coming to do a photo shoot with her, right? Correct. And it goes on, starting to talk about how dirty they're going to get and so forth, right? Correct. And by the end of the text message, he's really graphic about what he wants to do to Miss Arias, right? Correct. Given all this information about his behavior and the things that he actually said and the things that he did and what he wanted to do with Miss Arias, does that in any way place him as a victim of sexual humiliation? No, it does not. Do you remember, you were taught, asked questions about having an interview with the prosecutor, right? Correct. And the interview took place about five months before you testified. Correct. Or began testifying, right? Right. Uh, when you did that interview uh, with the prosecutor, that was in my office, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Was that in my office? Yes, it was. Okay. And when you, uh, you, do you live here in Arizona? No, I don't. Okay. So when you came out for that interview, did you bring all the boxes of evidence that you have with you? No, I didn't. Do you remember being asked the question about uh, whether or not Miss Arias was, sh or whether or not Miss Arias shot Mr. Alexander uh, in the closet? The Vague. Section is the question that was asked. Approach. Thank you. Sustained. Yesterday, Ms. Lila, do you remember having a conversation or being questioned by the prosecutor about what, where Ms. Arias shot Mr. Alexander? Yes. Did you have a chance to uh, review your notes? Yes, I did. And in reviewing your notes, does it state anywhere in there that Ms. Arias told you that she shot him in the closet? No. So that's not something Ms. Arias told you? No, it isn't. The nuances and the specific facts about where, by the time we get to June 4th and where the gunshot happens or what happens first, what happens last, 
Does that make, was that a big determining factor for you when you are making your assessment about the relationship being domestically violent? No, actually, I mean, what I looked at were the, the emails, the IMs, the, well, the, the various written materials that I had to really look at whether domestic violence occurred, not what happened the day of the murder, not what happened um, in particular. Uh, the, the, what I was focused on was looking at the issues of domestic violence in the context of domestic violence. Okay, and during your interview with the prosecutor back in November, was he asking you specific questions about what happened on June 4th? Yes. All right, and so based on the review of your notes, did you make a mistake when you told him that if you said anything about the shooting happening in a closet? Objection, we overruled. Yes, I made a mistake about that. Did, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, the questions that the prosecutor asked you about when Miss Arias went to speak to Bianca, a girl that Mr. McCartney started seeing. Okay? Right. All right. Okay. Do you remember being questioned about that, about, uh, about whether or not Miss Arias was still dating Mr. McCartney at the time that she went to go see Bianca? Yes, I remember that. And did you, as part of your assessment, did you review an interview um, or things that Mr. McCartney had to say? Yes, I did. And in reviewing what Mr. McCartney had to say, what is it that he had to say with regard to when Miss Arias went to speak to Bianca? Was, were they still dating? Oh, um, Mr. McCartney and, and Miss Arias were actually still dating, and uh, when she went up to when she went up to in, to talk to uh, Bianca. Okay, so they had not broken up yet. No. And so Mr. McCartney admitted that he was cheating on Miss Arias. Is that right? Correct. With regard to that particular conversation of, with Bianca between Miss Arias and this woman, Bianca, what about that conversation would have been important for you? That, um, that Miss Arias was direct about it, that by Miss Arias's account and by Mr. McCartney's account, that it was not a, a hostile, you know, angry kind of confrontation, but it was merely uh, a talk that they had and that they continued to talk for a period of time. And that was the end of it, that Miss Arias did not follow up uh, by any evidence that I've seen. She did not harass this woman. She did not, because I would look at that. I would look at, did she continue to, to call or make calls to this woman? Did she, uh, can, you know, that sort of thing. And none of that happened by any evidence that I have reviewed. Okay. Do you remember being asked questions by the prosecutor about whether or not Miss Arias said something to something about cutting her fingers when she was cutting apples? Yes. Based on your review of all of the information you have, is it your understanding that this information was originally told to one person, right? Yes. And then did that one person tell a second person? Yes. And did that second person then be interviewed about supposedly what Ms. Aries said? Yes. In any event, did that, that statement about cutting her fingers by when she was cutting apples, did this statement occur after June 4th and before she had been arrested? Yes. And is this statement something that was made, allegedly made, when she was still lying about what happened on June 4th? Yes. Yes, it was. And long before she told the truth about what happened? Yes. You were asked questions. Long before the truth of what happened. Sustained. Was this statement made long before Miss Arias uh, told you what she believes to be the truth? Yes. You were asked questions about uh, a knife being on the nightstand. Do you remember that? Yes. Is it your understanding that Miss Arias is not clear about where the knife was? Yes, I just wrote in my notes some of the things that were said. There was not clarity about it. Uh, knife on nightstand, I think I wrote in my notes. 
Yeah. Okay. And at, at later times, did she talk to you about not remembering exactly where things were because after uh, after after the attack? Yes, yeah. she she couldn't remember um, much after the attack at all. You had questions about uh, about jealousy, right? Yes. And questions about whether or not uh, Miss Arias exhibited any jealousy. Correct. In April of 2008, was Miss Arias texting with another man named Ryan Burns? Yes, she was. And was she starting? I, the beginning of a potential relationship with him? Yes, she was. Was she talking about going to see him? Yes, she was. And in fact, when she went to Utah, is that who she was going to see? Yes. The fact that she, in April of 2008, is talking to Ryan Burns, and I think in, uh, is she also at that point uh, registered on, on a website to meet new people? Yes, she's registered on LDS Link Up. Okay. Does that speak to her ability to start to this continual uh, slow separation she was making? Yes, I mean, she, she was pursuing a couple of people she'd met on LDS Link Up and um, beginning to pull away in a more uh, definitive way by looking to meet other men. And based on your experience and, and training and education, how do many uh, abusive partners react when the other partner is attempting to separate? Well, they get fearful when the other person, if, if they're not wanting it, um, they get fearful if the other person starts to leave. And in fact, there's research that talks about the most dangerous time for a battered woman being the time that she um, separates from the partner. Do you remember getting a hypothetical about a question, a hypothetical question about Mr. Alexander telling Mr. Freeman that he wanted Ms. Arias to move away? Yes. In your review, have you reviewed uh, journal entries from Mr. Alexander? Yes, I have. And did some of those entries come, uh, were written in May of 2008? Yes, they were. And in May of 2008, did he talk in his own journals about Jody moving away? Yes, he did. And how did he talk about it? He talked about um, Jody moving away as being good for both of them, that they, um, that they, didn't, they both needed discipline and that it would be good for him and for her if she moved. Is there anything in his journals about him fearing her? No, there isn't anything in his journals about him fearing her. Let me get this question exact. You were because you were asked questions about whether or not you had any other indications, I believe, other than Miss Arius's word um, that she caught Mr. Alexander masturbating to a picture of a little boy. Do you Correct. remember that question? Yes, I do. And you started to answer what other indications you saw that would support what Miss Arius said about catching Mr. Alexander, right? Correct. Are you aware that Mr. Alexander sent her boys' underwear? Yes. And that just doesn't come from Miss Arias' word, but did you also see text messages that indicate she was wearing boys' underwear for Mr. Alexander? Yes. Uh, did you get... Um, did you get information or have information that Miss Arias was clean shaven or completely waxed so that she had no hair? Yes. In her pubic area? Yes. And that that was something that Mr. Alexander liked? Yes. And did you get information that Mr. Alexander liked Jody to wear pigtails? Yes. And in fact, on June 4th, do we have a picture of her, of course, nude, but 
from the top up. She, does she have pigtails? Yes, she does. And did you get information that, that um, Mr. Alexander liked her to dress as a schoolgirl? Yes. And besides all of that, did you also, in listening to this phone sex tape, did you also hear his own voice? Yes, I did. And did you hear his own voice when it's, when after Miss Aries allegedly had an orgasm, he tells her, it sounds like you're this 12-year-old girl having her first orgasm? Yes. And did you hear him say, it's so hot? Yes. And that she had to clarify, what did you say? And he repeated, a 12-year-old girl having her first orgasm. Correct. And did you also hear out of Mr. Alexander's own mouth that he said, like corking the pot of a little girl? Yes. And this was all recorded, right? This was recorded, yes. Based on that information, do you think, do you think that information is supportive at all of when the prosecutor asked you if there was any other indications besides Jody's word that she caught him masturbating to pictures of a little boy? I thought that was collaborative data that supported that. Do you remember being asked questions from the prosecutor about uh, Jody's truthfulness? Yes. As part of your uh, assessment, did you review interviews from previous boyfriends? Yes, I did. And that would be Mr. McCartney? Mr. McCartney and Mr. Brewer. Okay. And how long were she and Mr. McCartney together? They were together approximately two years. And how long were she and Mr. Brewer together? Approximately four years. And so this six years of time that she was with uh, two other men was prior to her meeting Mr. Alexander, is that right? Correct, and, and they still have relationship. I mean, they've, they've remained friends. That, she, that Jody's remained friends with both Matt and Daryl? Yes. Does Mr. Brewer have a son that he adores? Yes, he does. Son and, named Jack. Okay, and did he have this son when he was in a relationship, when he was uh, in a relationship with Jody? Yes, he did. Did he, did, to your knowledge, based on the interviews you've read, did Jody spend a lot of time with his son? Jody spent time with his son, Jack, yes. And was, did Mr. Brewer view that as positive? Yes, he did. Those two people that were with her um, in, a, in a committed relationship with her for a while, did you ever see anyone, did you ever see them accuse her of being a liar? No. Did you ever see them even complain that she was a liar? No. Now, there was a lot of talk uh, on cross-examination about how you don't rely on just one statement or incident. Do you remember that? Yes. And the, the, prosecutor, the prosecutor also asked you a lot about stalking, didn't he? Yes, he did. And he asked you a lot, or asked you about uh, Mr. Alexander being afraid of Jody. Correct. Okay. The, the questioning that centers around Mr. Alexander being afraid of Jody comes from just one statement, doesn't it? It does. And that's a statement that came from Mr. Alexander's mouth. Correct. And is this the same mouth that lied about his virginity? Yes. Lied about his virginity to his church? Correct. And did he I'm lie? In the readings and everything that you've read, are you aware that Mr. Alexander portrayed himself as a virgin? Yes. Someone who's never had sex at all? Yes. And he was, uh, based on your information, was he a priesthood holder in his church? Yes. And in order to be a priesthood holder in the Mormon church, do you have to follow their laws? Sustained. Are you aware of whether or not somebody has to follow uh, the laws with regard to the church in order to be a priesthood member? I don't know all the laws of the Mormon Church, but my understanding is that. Peter 
Approach, please. That. Did Miss Arius ever give you any information about what it would, some of what it would take to be a priesthood holder in the Mormon Church? Yes. And did you talk about whether or not a person would have to follow the laws of chastity in order to stay or remain a priesthood holder? Yes. And so is that where your understanding comes from? Yes. So, based on that understanding, if um, if somebody was not following, if Mr. Alexander was not following the laws of chastity because he's having sex, any se type of sexual contact, but yet was still a priesthood holder in the Mormon church, is there a falsehood? Is there a deception going on? Yes. It's a lack of foundation as to whether or not he was a priesthood holder. It's prior testimony. Overruled. You may answer. Is there a deception there? Yes. And is that same deception something that went on with um, his own friends, believing that he was a virgin? Yes. And did that same deception go on with his own family, believing that he was a virgin? As far as I know. And is this similar? Do you have, do you, did you find deception when he talked, when you look at the relationship between Miss Andrews and Mr. Alexander? Yes. And did he have the same type of deception when he told Miss Alexander that he wasn't dating Jody. Yep. When he, t when he told, I'm sorry, when he told Miss Andrews that he wasn't dating Jody. Yes. And when he took Jody to have a soup pie at the same time he was dating Miss Andrews. Correct. Is that deceptive? Yes. She says she didn't know. Was Miss Andrews aware of whether or not she he took Jody to have a supai before she, he took her to have a supai. Objection, like a how? Sustained. Based on an email that you read? Did she know this? Objection, leave. Overruled. Yes, Miss Andrews uh, said that she did not Objection, know. Hearsay. Overruled. Miss okay. Andrews did not know that Miss Arias was going on that trip, although she suspected, I believe. Okay. Something. All right, and this, this is going into late, uh, the later part of the year in 2007, is that right? Correct. And so during this time, um, during this time, is Mr. Alexander leading a life different from, uh, a public life different from his private life? Yes, he is. He's leading a double life. What does it do to a person when they lead a double life? Sustained. In your practice, in meeting with, with the different women and different men, um, is, and, and dealing with abusive men that you've dealt with, do most abusive men act out in the workplace or in other situ family situations, not their intimate partner, but other outside family situations, do you see that they are acting, having this abusive nature to them when they're with friends and other people other than their intimate partner? No, in fact, the, most of the research will show that most people who are abusive in intimate family situations aren't abusive at work, most, and aren't abusive in general, that it's, it's a secret for lots of them, and it's something that nobody else would be aware of and that nobody else would have any idea. In fact, they might have a hard time believing that this person was because they can be very good people in, in many areas of their lives and are very good people in many areas of their lives. 
And so does it take a lot of energy sometimes then for these people to, to have this double type of life? We were just talking about your practice and dealing with um, in your uh, groups that you have with with battered men or men who batter, right? Correct. Okay. And we were asking, and we were just talking about how some of these men who batter find it um, maybe abusive with their intimate partners, but may lead a totally different life outside that. Correct. Okay. In your experience with these people, do you get an idea or an understanding from them if whether or not this is difficult for them to carry on with this? Does this take a lot of energy for them? Sustained. What number? I don't. Maybe approach. I don't know. Yeah. years that you've been practicing, do you have any idea of numbers of how many men you've dealt with, the men who who batter that you've dealt with that have had this situation where they may be abusive at home but not at work? And maybe not just, and, that, and, may, and let me add, add to that, maybe not just the men that you've specifically dealt with, but some of the women that have talked to you about it and some of the women that have talked to you about how their husband is somebody who's maybe in the... Um, uh, Politics or somebody, something in a high, well respected area? Women, how they would know. The women. Well, did he answer the question? Uh, I would say um, well, over, well over half, probably two thirds, where other people are not aware of 
uh, what's going on. A double life is something a little different than that. I mean, that's one area, but carrying on a double life takes more energy than that. Okay. All right. So well over two-thirds, you said? I said anywhere from a half to two-thirds. I suspect about two-thirds, but I've never, like, kept track. Right. Okay. So in dealing with, with these type of men, uh, is it difficult for them to have this double life? Does it, is it difficult for them to maintain? Does it take a lot of energy for them to do? It takes a lot of energy uh, to do a double life. And there's one thing about, um, you know, having people not know about the fact that you may be abusive in your intimate relationship. It's another thing to have a spiritual dimension added to that where you are, you know, seen and, and your whole life is seen as sort of a moral pillar. And I believe that is an incredible struggle when I've worked with people of faith and they have, they have a belief about who they are and that's the part of themselves that they care about. That's the part of themselves that they really value. And when you're going against your moral core, it is incredibly difficult for anybody when you live a life of deception. It's one thing to have people not know that you can be abusive. It's another thing to have people not only not know that you're not abusive, but not, but not know that you're, you're living a life that's antithetical to everything you stand for. So, for instance, um, there, was, there would be so much for Mr. Alexander to lose. And I've never, ever believed Mr. Alexander was a sociopath. I believe that Mr. Alexander cares. I believe Mr. Alexander... Based on what you know about Mr. Alexander's uh, life and who he portrayed himself to be, did he have a lot to lose if the truth were to come out? He has a, he has a significant amount to lose. He has his standing with his profession, uh, which is, um, you know, he, ha he has so many people. In fact, his two... How does he have a lot to lose? His two closest friends um, are, one of them heads his PPL division, and uh, that's where he earns his money. And he is well thought of there. He's a motivational speaker there. If his private life came out, I think it would destroy a lot of that. If um, he would lose his priesthood standing. And I think one of the hardest things is losing what you believe is the core or essence of who you are, which is, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a decent human being because I do these things and because I adhere to these tenets, but yet you're not adhering to those tenets at all. And I think that's incredibly self-destructive and takes a huge toll on a human being. What happens when somebody has fear about, about these private things coming out about them? Well, in, in cases of domestic violence, fear often leads to anger and rage. And anger and rage is normally directed at the people that you feel the safest with, the people that you feel are not going to tell the people that uh, are the safest in effect, safest targets. And in this case, Ms. Arias is the safest target. And is Ms. Arias the only one who knew about this secret life? The state. Is Ms. Arias, did Ms. Arias know about his secret life? Yes, she did. And so let's compare that then with some of the questions you were asked about Ms. Arias's truthfulness, okay? All right. Um, with regard to her truthfulness, the lies or the lack of truthfulness, the lies that she told, when did those start happening? After Mr. Alexander was killed. And given the fact that she lies about killing Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. And did she lie about whether or not she was even there? Yes, she did. 
And then did she change her story and, and have another lie about two people, two intruders that supposedly killed Mr. Alexander? Yes, she did. Given all of these lies um, that she told after June 4th of 2008, do they define her for you? Do they cause you problems in her believability? No, they don't. Why is that? Because if Miss Arias was a really good liar, she would have planned a really good lie, and she didn't. All right, nothing further. of a really good lie. All ruled. The answer will stand. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take an early noon recess. I'm going to ask that you return at 1.15. 1.15 today, please remember the admonition. You are excused. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Ms. LaViolette, you may step down, counsel. I would like to see you at the bench. We are at recess.